Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting Great British Road Journey. This week we're going to take a look around Bedfordshire, a county that appears to contribute nothing to society and it's home to some of the finest towns in the UK like Dunstable and Luton. We'll take a look at those another day because today our journey starts in Biggleswade and via a bit of an odd route to suit my narrative we'll be ending up in Ampthill. As always, to help navigate our way there we'll be using a copy of my 1923 Michelin guidebook, Period Correct Maps. We start then in the market town of Biggleswade, the largest town on the east side of Bedfordshire with a population of 22,000, a figure that's risen since the days of my guidebook from 5,400. I'm on the south side of the town because I wanted to take a look at the A1 and the Biggleswade South Roundabout. Back in the old days, the A1 used to run right through the centre of Biggleswade and that was jolly lovely, but as is always the case, over the years the traffic size and numbers increased and it was decided to build a bypass around the town and that became the A1 that we know today. The Big Biggleswade South Roundabout wouldn't come until later. Initially, the A1 and London Road, aka the old A1, met at an offset T-junction. It's not exactly clear as to when the roundabout was added, sometime in the 1970s or 1980s, I suspect, but that's not important because what we're looking at today is a roundabout that was modified in 2014. The reason for these modifications is that one day this roundabout might have a flyover added to it and that couldn't be done without widening the roundabout and realigning some of the carriageways. It's interesting actually because when you look at the roundabout on one side there's space in between the carriageways for a flyover to be added and these carriageways would most likely become slip roads. And on the other side there's space for slip roads to be added, the existing carriageway would most likely be altered and the flyover connected to it. As to when the flyover will be built, I've got no idea, everybody seems to have forgotten all about it but at least a load of money has been spent on getting us ready and prepared for nothing. Speaking of nothing, Biggleswade is a bit of a struggle. I read about lots of old exciting industry but there's none of it left. A brewery, now an Asda, an ironworks, now an Aldi, a vehicle coach builder, now some shops and the Ivel Cycle Works that closed in 1922, a year before my guidebook's release. So instead I thought we'd take a look at a stretch of tarmac on the north side of Biggleswade because that's as interesting as it gets. This used to be part of the A1 that ran through the middle of Biggleswade before the bypass was built. I imagine for the one house situated at the end of this road that was quite an improvement because the A1 no longer ran right past their front door. Now the A1 runs right past their front door as a dual carriageway but separated by a fence. Moving on, and we'll be making our way to the town of Sandy via the A1, which mostly follows the route of the original roads, until that is we get to Sandy itself, where we've got no choice but to use the B1042 to get into Sandy. There's a great little coffee drive through to be found on Sandy Roundabout, this has got nothing to do with anything, but by writing a coffee into the script I'm forced to stop and get one. Oh no! The town of Sandy has more than tripled in size since the days of my guidebook. Back then there were only around 3,300 people living here and it wasn't even a market town, it was just some town. The name is quite interesting, Sandy. Why do we reckon it's called Sandy? I can't quite figure it out. Yeah, it really is that simple. Sandy is named Sandy because it's Sandy and Sandy, specifically the Sandy Hills, which are the result of some geological land stuff. Whilst there's nothing left of it today, there was once a brick and tile work situated nearby which would have used the sand to produce, well, bricks and tiles. It would have had its own siding that connected up to the mainline railway that runs alongside, but no trace of this remains. But what I did notice on the old maps is that there used to be a railway crossover in this location, and on closer inspection, some of the supporting infrastructure still remains today. There's also a bridge that used to carry one of the main roads into Sandy across the railway and we can see today where the railway would have run underneath. It's all long since been demolished and even in the days of my guidebook the brick and tile works was already in a state of abandonment. Before we continue towards Bedford I wanted to take a quick detour to the north of Sandy to look at an old airfield. RAF Thamesford was set up in the 1940s and was possibly one of the most secretive airfields due to the type of personnel based here. Basically during the second small disagreement people like James Bond would be flown from this airfield to infiltrate the enemy, deliver vital supplies or rescue friendly forces, usually under the cover of night. It was all carried out in the most top secret of ways to the point where a pretend farm was built on the airfield to hide the true use of some of the buildings. Today what looks like a fairly ordinary barn is where the special duty squadron as they were known went to collect their supplies or equipment for the mission ahead. Our mission is a little less interesting as we head away from Thamesford back through Sandy Sandy and then on to Bedford. To get there we'll pick up the A603 which according to my old maps used to be the A603. Thank f for that. This should be easy and looking at it it seems that the road hasn't changed at all 
all since its earlier days, so I guess we'll just get on with it then. Not so fast, because as we pass through the village of Willington, I am insisting on making a stop to look at whatever this is. It's the remains of some railway infrastructure, maybe an old platform, and on old maps it's marked as Willington Sidings, or a bit later on, Willington Station. The railway line it used to sit on was known as the Varsity Line, a railway that ran from Oxford to Cambridge before it was all closed in the 1960s. As of 2015, there are plans to reinstate the railway, but um, we're not doing so well with large railway building projects, so we'll see how that works out. The real reason for stopping here is because in 1932, the Michelin Tire Company would trial their own locomotive on this very railway. That's the same Michelin Tire Company who put together my guidebook, and like the guidebook, I reckon the locomotive was put together as a way to sell more tires. It was called the Michelin, and it was terrible. What they did was replace the proven metal-wheeled arrangement with tires, around 20 of them, leading to a train that was inoperable every time it got a flat tire, which was almost a daily occurrence. Apparently, the ride was very smooth, but it never really caught on, except it kind of did because it led to the development of tired metro systems. These work very well in certain situations, and who makes the tires for those? Michelin do, so I guess they got what they wanted after all. Using the Uniroyal tires on my car, we'll be heading into Bedford. Michelin, get in touch. With all this promotion I'm doing for you, I really should be on some free of charge Michelin tires, don't you think? Our route continues along the A603, which other than a few roundabouts, is still fairly true to its original form. When we get to Bedford, however, rather than a nice simple right turn like it used to be, we're forced onto a stupid one-way system, and then another. After much dicking around, we arrive in Bedford, which in the days of my guidebook was a large town indeed, with a population of around 40,000. Today that's grown to over 106,000. My guidebook suggests that we might like to pay a visit to what it calls Castle Mound, which is, as the name suggests, a mound for a castle. It's situated right in the middle of Bedford alongside the Great River Ouse, and whilst I thought they just built a small castle on a hill, what we're actually looking at here is a small part of a much larger structure. Wikipedia holds the answers, and as you can see, there was a lot more to this castle than just a small mound. It's believed to have looked like this in the 1220s, but possibly dates back even further to 1100. In the mid to late 2000s, a supporting wall was added, presumably to hold everything in place, and they also added a small lookout hut, simply to shelter you from the rain, a complete waste of time, because as we know, it never rains in England. Apparently, Bedford's population is a third Italian or of Italian descent, making it the largest concentration of Italian immigrants in the UK, which is grande. The reason for this can be found a short distance from Bedford, and to get there, we'll be following the B530, which according to our old maps, used to be numbered the A418. And just off the B530 or the A418 is the weird village of Stewartby that once upon a time used to be more industrial land than it was village. It was home to Stuartby Brickworks, or the London Brick Company, an organisation who employed thousands of people, including Italian immigrants who came over to the UK during the 1950s, and this is why in Bedford you'll find so many Italians, or those of Italian descent. The Brickworks was an interesting place. At one time it was the largest brickworks in the world, producing half a billion bricks in a year, and it was one of a few sites owned by the London Brick Company that collectively produced 1.75 billion bricks a year. The Stuartby site was forced to close in 2008 because despite some investment, it couldn't meet the emissions targets set by the UK government, so it had to go. Since then, a lot of the site has been demolished, with some small sections being redeveloped, but there's still a few abandoned buildings left that have become a popular destination for urban explorers. Sadly, the kiln chimneys that had become a bit of a landmark for the area were demolished in 2021. Here's what they used to look like. One of the next villages along from Stuartby is Millbrook, which nobody cares about because it's more famous for its absolutely massive vehicle proving grounds. It was built by General Motors in the 1960s, and the reason they decided to build this place from scratch rather than utilise an old airfield, which was the normal procedure, was because the land here is hilly and bumpy, which is far better for testing vehicles than a flat airfield. On 700 acres of land at Millbrook in Bedfordshire, Vauxhall Motors have built their own world of roads that reproduces every motoring condition. Along with hilly and twisty test tracks, they also constructed a two-mile-long banked oval circuit suitable for high-speed vehicle testing, although given that they mostly developed Vauxhalls at the site, I don't really think high-speed testing was entirely necessary. The site has changed ownership a few times over the years, and it's no longer in the hands of a vehicle manufacturer. It's now owned by UTAC a market-leading international group in digital and sustainable mobility, blah, blah, blah. 
Moving on to Ampt Hill next, and my guidebook suggests we visit the Hoe of Houghton. I've got a tenner, let's see what we can get. Sorry, I misread. My guidebook means the House of Houghton, or Houghton House as it's known today. This ruined mansion was built in 1615, and the only reason it's still here, presumably, is because it's gained Grade 1 listed status, meaning its removal is a bit of a legal challenge. That and it's now owned by English Heritage, who probably check in on the place from time to time, but this does mean you can visit and take a look for no cost. The mansion was abandoned in 1794, with its owner stripping the building and selling anything of value, and I like to think that since the days of my guidebook, it hasn't changed at all. Here's a cheeky little bonus. If you do visit Houghton House, then keep an eye out at the entrance for this pillbox that was constructed sometime around 1940 during the Second Small Disagreement. There are loads of these scattered up and down the country that would be used for defence should we be invaded. And there we are then, guys. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is, of course, a button specifically for that. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. That would be wicked sweet awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John. You've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting Great British Road Journey. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.